I wish to introduce Robert Spencer. You, you know him as the director of Jihad Watch, uh, the program of uh, the David Howard's Freedom Center, uh, my colleague, my duo of the dynamic duo, uh, author of 15 books. He's led seminars on Islam and Jihad for the FBI. Uh, listen, no one has his bio. His impressively scholarly, you know, you know, brilliant wordsmith that he is. But I want to say something because I've worked with Spencer now since 2008. And what you don't know about Mr. Spencer is there is no braver man. Whatever plot I ever came up with, whatever ad, whatever conference, he never said, you know, this could be trouble. <laughs> he has joined with me, and I will tell you, he's exceptional and brave because so many people have fallen away because I won't trim. I won't trim. We got so many trimmers that the garden is perfect. He won't trim. He never shirks. He never shrugs. He's the bravest man I know. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Spencer. Thank you very much. It's uh, so wonderful to be here. I wanted to ask you, you know, history generally calls various periods of time, the, the Gilded Age, the Gay 90s, the Roaring 20s. I think that this age that we live in now is the age of absurdity. <laughs> the other day, there was a Muslim in France screaming, Lahu Akbar, and he stabbed a rabbi. And the French authorities said, he has psychological problems, it has nothing to do with terrorism. The other day in Montreal, a woman in a car, a Muslim woman driving a car, ran over two police officers while screaming, Allahu Akbar. And the Montreal police assured us it had nothing to do with terrorism. And so this is an absurd age. We know, obviously, that there is a war. The Islamic State has declared war on the United States. That's ISIS, or ISIL, as the president calls them. We know that Iran has been on a war footing with the United States since 1979. And every time somebody screams Allahu Akbar and kills somebody or blows something up, authorities assure us that it has nothing to do with Islam and that Islam is peaceful and benign and that these people are mentally ill and that they are isolated, discreet criminal acts instead of what they should be regarded as battles in a war. And now we know, actually, because of some recent revelations, why we live in this absurd age where obvious reality is so brazenly denied by everyone in the political and media elite. And we know that for one primary reason this is happening, that they're being paid. We know now that George Soros funded a massive campaign and his organizations paid millions of dollars to mainstream media sources to get favorable coverage of the Iran nuclear deal. Do you think that that was the first time that the media has been paid? I doubt it. Think about some other things. We know that Omar Mateen shot, killed 49 people and wounded 53 others in the gay nightclub in Florida. And right after that happened, there were all sorts of stories about how, no, 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 this has nothing to do with Islam, despite all his statements about ISIS and all the rest of it, the usual things that are, hap that, that, that are going along with an attack like that, the screams of Allahu Akbar and everything else, nothing to do with Islam. It turns out that he was gay and he was angry because somebody had infected him with HIV, and so he went and shot up the nightclub. And we heard this, right? Did you hear that? And we heard this from multiple mainstream media sources that this had nothing to do with Islam, and he was uh, having gay liaisons, he had gay apps on his phone, and then his lover showed up, heavily disguised, on CNN, I think it was, maybe MSNBC, what's the difference, and <laughs> saying that uh, this had nothing to do with Islam, and that this guy was just angry about his gay relationships. And then, on page 37 of the Times, if that, buried in the news cycle, 
was the fact that the FBI actually found no gay apps on his phone and no evidence that he had any gay relationships at all. And then you wonder, who, who, who put that guy up heavily disguised? Why was he heavily disguised? He wasn't under any threat. Where did this disinformation campaign come from? And it's the same answer, that people are being paid to do this. And it's very clear now. The Iran nuclear deal was put over on the American people by the Obama administration that knowingly lied, and then Ben Rhodes, Obama's foreign policy aide, boasts about lying about it. And it comes out then that the media was paid to cover it in this way. Now, today is August 22nd, 2016. On August 22nd, 2015, no, it's the 21st, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm forward thinking. And a year ago today, I would not have been nearly as optimistic speaking to you as I am today. And that is because, in the first place, it is starting to come out what's happening. I couldn't have told you that the media was paid last year. Now it's been established and documented. And so we know that there is a massive globalist campaign to destroy nation states and destroy nationalism and essentially make every place pretty much like every other place in the utopian hope that that will mean that there will be no more war and no more conflicts because why bother? And that that campaign is being funded by moneyed interests. In other words, it's starting to come out now. It's been exposed. A year ago, we could think that these things and then it would be dismissed as some crazy conspiracy theory. Now it's documented. A year ago, the hegemony of these political and media elites was essentially unchallenged. Now, there have been two massive challenges to them, and that is why we should have every reason to hope at this point, despite how bleak things are, than they are. The first one was the Brexit vote. The Brexit vote... The Brexit vote was against all expectations, right? If you remember, the polls all told us it's going to lose. Nigel Farage in Britain, who was champion, championing the, the, the Brexit vote, the, the vote to leave, he actually conceded defeat. Not once, not twice, but three times. He said, well, it looks like they won. And then he had to eat his words and claim victory. <laughs> Age of absurdity. And nobody expected that Britain was gonna to vote to get out. But people were fed up. They were not fed up in a way that they're gonna tell a pollster because they know the social opprobrium that will come upon them if they say, yes, yes, I'm a racist, bigoted, Islamophobe, and I want out of the European <laughs> Union that is pushing this Muslim migrant invasion on us. But people did vote that way. And whether or not, whether or not Britain actually leaves the European, the European Union, because that's still a quite open question, especially with Theresa May, who invites in every jihadi on the planet into Britain. Right now, there are two Pakistani imams who, in Pakistan, they have a blasphemy law, you know? Death penalty for blasphemy. There was a courageous politician a few years back who was campaigning for the repeal of the death penalty for blasphemy. Blasphemy. Salman, uh, Taf, uh, never mind, you can look up his name. Anyway. <laughs> He was murdered by a Muslim who was in favor of the blasphemy law and then became a hero in Pakistan. These imams praised the killer, glorified him as a warrior for Allah, and they were led into Britain. No problem. They're on a tour of mosques, a speaking tour in mosques right now. Theresa May, the Prime Minister of Britain, admitted them and banned us for opposing jihad. I was actually banned. The letter from the Home Office banning me from Britain said that you said that Islam has a doctrine of warfare against unbelievers, and so you can't come in. Now, obviously, that's obviously true, and she let in these two guys, and there are hundreds of other jihadis that she's let in all the time, and they obviously believe that Islam has a doctrine of warfare against unbelievers. The difference between them and me is that they're for it. You can't be against it and get into Britain nowadays. But the thing is, so I don't know that they're actually going to leave with a prime minister like that. But the, the point has been made nonetheless. The 52% who voted to leave, they're not going to go away and they're not going to give up. Yeah. 
and the power of the elites is cracking. That's what that vote tells us. The second big sign of the weakening of the elite stranglehold on the public discourse and on public policy is the candidacy and the success of Trump. because Trump threatens them like nobody has threatened them since Ronald Reagan. And he shows up the deep frustration of the American people that we're tired of being lied to, we're tired of being deceived, we're tired of being condescended to by these people who presume to tell us not to believe the evidence of our own senses, but to believe, no, 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 this guy screaming Allahu Akbar and waving a Quran around while he's beheading somebody has nothing to do with Islam. And Donald Trump has said more, he hasn't said everything right, but he has said more about the jihad threat than any candidate since John Quincy Adams. <laughs> and since I'm afraid Adams is not available to run this year, that narrows our choices. But whatever happens with Trump, the fact is that the things that the media has given him the most trouble about are the things that make him the most popular. Build the wall, Muslim ban on immigration. These are the things that people are fi saying, finally, we have a politician who's actually addressing our concerns. Instead of doing these things that are committing essentially national and civilizational suicide and telling us it's good for us. And so, whatever happens, whether he wins or loses, these people who have brought him to the point that where he is now are not going to go away either. And the political and media elites are deeply threatened. I don't know that there's any amount of money George Soros can pay for mainstream media coverage that is going to completely destroy and obliterate the forces that are now arrayed against the elites. And that is all to the good. We have every reason to believe that as things continue to get worse, they're going to get better and better. Now, that's paradoxical, but it's absolutely true. Because as the situation continues, and as they continue to try to reassert their power, there is going to be more and more of a pushback. And I do believe that uh, the motto of my home state of South Carolina is apropos here, Dum Spiro Sparrow, while I breathe, I hope. And as the uh, great philosopher Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over. <laughs> and it ain't over. It's a lot less over than it was a year ago today. And so I thank you for your presence here, encourage you, as Pamela did, to fight on in every way you possibly can in your spheres, and to take hope that, you know, we really have the easy job, because all we have to do is tell the truth. And I don't have a good enough memory to be a liar. <laughs> and... The elites, they have to keep blanketing us with this nonsense because it's so obviously false. Every time there's another jihad attack, there are 10 stories on CNN and MSNBC and the New York Times about how Islam is a religion of peace. And they have to keep yelling at us about that because it's so obviously ridiculous. And so in this age of absurdity, let us not be absurd. And that's all we have to do to win. Thank you very much. two of the most courageous people I know and who have done more for liberty than anyone. Thank you. To these 